And the idea to come here was to speak a little bit about uh, new horizons in, in ovarian stimulation and how to uh, personalize the treatment, how we do things today, opposed to giving the same medication to all patients in a, in a set format. So to understand what we do today, we have to understand, um, we have to understand um, where we come from. And we come from here. This is 1978. Some of you in the room probably were at these really exciting times when the first birth after uh, a reimplantation of a human embryo was published in The Lancet. This was uh, Nobel Prize winners, as you, as you well know. And from here, many things have changed in the last 40 years. And I think today we, we are in the era of, of customization. Everything is individualized. You can uh, individualize your website, of course. You can individualize your drinks. And of course, you can individualize medicine. And these are the, the so-called four piece of personalized medicine. And the medicine we do today should be predictive using biomarkers or anything so we can more or less predict the outcome. It should be personalized according to the genetic and biologic uh, individuality of, of each person, each patient. It should be preventive to avoid complications. And of course, it should be participatory because especially in reproductive medicine, what we do on a daily basis is a compromise with the patient. We set out the expectations, we minimize or we maximize the expectations, and then the patient agrees, and then we go for the treatment. So I think these four P's are, are helping us how to customize the treatment. And this takes us along with a new concept of, of theranostics, which is a combination of words that you can imagine. They put together a diagnosis and therapeutics, and actually this is going to be uh, helping us to choose the best protocol, and at the end of the day, to choose the right drug for the right patient at the right dose and at the right time. So this is actually the way we're practicing today. So it, theoretically, it should be more uh, cost effective. This is uh, how uh, things are moving from the conventional medicine, let's say, to today's medicine. You have the biomarkers here. Where you can choose the patient at risk and just think about AMH or AFC, and you can uh, individualize according to these biomarkers, as we will see later, if it's going to be a high responder or a poor responder. And also you take the, not only the biomarkers in fluids, but also the imaging, which is again also used, uh, we know a lot of this because we use the probe continuously with our patients. We know how many answer follicles we can see and how many follicles we may expect when we treat the patient. And then we are going to establish a treatment according to these uh, diagnostic measures. So this is how we do clinical decision making today. We, we have to take advantage of the drug advances, as you know. We, we have to combine this uh, diagnosis and therapeutics in a, in a word. We, we will be using more and more the genomics, and we will hear some of this on this meeting. Obviously, and put this into context in the, in the unique response of this particular patient in this particular cycle, and the current challenges that, that is going to uh, make a clinical decision making a reality. So we should actually ask ourselves three questions about individualized ovarian stimulation. And I remove the C because it's not control anymore. I think we can talk about ovarian stimulation but not control ovarian stimulation. So the question would be, is this good for the patient, the, the customization of the, of the treatment? Is this feasible? Can we do this? And is it real? I mean, do we have data for this? So the first question, is it good for the patient? I think we can answer clearly. And if we take an example from other areas of the medicine, like oncology, for instance, and you talk today about breast cancer, no one it speaks about breast cancer as one disease. If you talk to oncologists, medical oncologists or, or surgeons, they need the pathology report, the TNM status, the hormone receptor status, the molecular profile, and then they individualize the treatment. And this is why success in breast cancer treatment has increased dramatically and it has been less and less invasive for the patient. So it's clear that, that uh, we, we need to individualize and it's good. And this is what happens when we expose patients to treatments. This is when you have uh, underexposed the follicles to FSH, if you give or, or um, gonadotropins in general, you will have too little uh, response. But if you overexpose these uh, follicles to, to FSH and LH or HMG or whatever you're using, you may have a risk of hyperstimulation. And you know that if you have uh, a low response, the risk of cancellation is high, but if you have a high response, you may have hyperstimulation, you may compromise oocyte quality, and we may compromise endometrial receptivity. So we want to be in the middle, something in between. And something in between, you have to put numbers, you have to put data. It's not just a guess. And we can guess, looking at data, but uh, like, like this uh, graph from um, Sesun Kara, I'm sure you have seen this slide many times, I'm sure it will be shown in this meeting more than once. 
it's quite illustrative, but this is a summary of data from the early 90s until uh, 2010. It's almost half a million cycles, but this is data from the past. But it, it is quite uh, still uh, useful because it shows us that if you have a low response, unwanted low response, the live birth rate is going to be minimal. And if you have too high response, the fresh embryo transfer success is going to be compromised. So we want to be something in between, and something in between could be between 8 and 14. That would be ideal response. We know that we have 6 or 7 extra legs, the outcome is not going to be optimal, and if we have more than 15, the risk of OHSA is going to increase. We have data from the US also, this is uh, from SART, uh, more recent data, this is 2008 to 2010, uh, about 250,000 cycles, huge database, and again, if you look at the live birth rate, it plateaus around 15. And after that, the increase in OHSS is huge. So something between 8 and 15 would be reasonable. And it is true that the more oocytes you get, uh, there's some debate here, and people will say the more oocytes, the better, because more pregnancies, but some others will say this is not correct. And the truth is that if you get more oocytes, which is here, you get, yes, more eggs, but you don't get more high-quality blastocysts. Even if you have more eggs, the number of good-quality blastocysts and altogether blastocysts is going to be more or less stable. So it seems like once you cross the threshold, the extra eggs that you recruit from atresia are not good enough to make good embryos. So we have to compromise here. We, we are looking for an, a, 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 not a mild response, not a hyper response. We want an adequate response. And here it's important to take into consideration, obviously, the benefit for the patient, which basically is life birth rate, is baby at home, uh, the risk for the patient, cancellation, uh, hyperstimulation, and, and of course the cost. And the cost is not only the money, it's also the time to pregnancy. So can we do this? Can, how, how, do, how do we do this? Is this feasible? How do we choose a protocol? And the idea is to be uh, precise and accurate. If you are only precise, it's good, but you're far from the focus, so it's not good enough. If you are um, accurate around the focus, but not very precise, again, it's not good enough. You are missing, I mean, I think you have a lot of variability there. If you are not precise and not accurate, you better change your job and do something else. <laughs> so we want to be here, right? We want to be accurate and precise, and that's how we should choose the protocol. And how do we do this? We copy. We just look at others, we read papers. Well, if they do this in the US, maybe I should do this. If they do this in Denmark or in Romania, and we try and play, and it's trial and error. This is how we, how we advance. There's one thing that is also very interesting to know, and is that this is not always reproducible. There is what we call intercycle variation within the same patient. This paper is really interesting from Luke Rombots, uh, published in FNS recently, and it shows how the same patient with the same medication, given three cycles consecutive, you will see a huge variation cycle to cycle. So it's not that we change the protocol, it's not that this different patient population is exactly the same patient, and you can see that there is a variability of about 25%. Some normal responders will become high responders, some normal responders will become poor responders, and back again to normal response. So we have to realize that this cycle to cycle variation is true and sometimes if the next cycle goes better then the patient ourselves says, oh we chose the best protocol and if it goes wrong then the patient will say doctor you did something wrong but sometimes we're just looking at biological variability which I think is interesting to understand and also to to set clear expectations to the patient so which biomarkers do we use which uh, which do you use in your practice well, we have these surveys that are sent out uh, across the world. I'm sure many of you participated in this particular one. And they were asking, which one do you think is the best to evaluate the vernal reserve? And as you can see here, AMH was by far the winner. You can see this is 2014. I think today the usage of AMH will be even higher. It was 51%. Then antifollicle count was a, a second by very close. And then you have some uh, others here. You have uh, FSH, LH, E2, and the classical ones that are still are being used. But I think these two outweigh the others, uh, at least today. So this is the, uh, the use of biomarkers that are extremely useful. They are help us to predict the ovarian response. And I think today no one is doing IVF or ovarian stimulation in general without looking at least at AFC and most of you probably uh, to the hormones. They're going to give us more accurate uh, prediction than the baseline clinical data for sure. It allows to personalize the ovarian stimulation, which protocol, which combination of, of drugs would be ideal, which agonist or antagonist. It's going to help us to optimize the live birth rate because we may uh, reduce the cancellation, not to underexpose the follicles, but not to overexpose them and the risk of hyperstimulation. So we may reduce the iatrogenic complications. And, and last but not least, it's going to help us to manage the expectations of the patient. I think this is very important 
patients, sometimes they come to you when they are 38, 40, 42, 44, and they think, as, as Professor uh, just mentioned now, because I'm doing IVF, I'm fine. And we have to reduce this expectation. And we know that at 42 or 44, the chances of having a baby at home, even if you do IVF with your own eggs, are, are really low. So this is something that we talk in the consultation, we look at the scan, we say, well, we only see two antrophocals, let's see your AMH, and still the patient is not very convinced. Then the AMH comes and says, well, your AMH is 0.1, and that's when they say, oh, okay, now I understand. So I think this is going to help us to convince also patients with, with a different perspective. And we know patients are different. We may have patient number one, which is a 24-year-old, first IVF cycle, uh, nice AMH, nice antrophocal count, low BMI, ideal patient. How many of these do you get in your practice? Very low, I'm sure. Patient number two is 31, quite young, but uh, second IVF, uh, AMH is starting to diminish, AFC8, and very high BMI. This is a more common case. And the most common, at least in my practice, is patient number three, which is 39. Mean age of our patients in, in Madrid is 37. Uh, fourth IVF cycle, so these patients, as you know, they go from clinic to clinic. They, they go shopping around. AMH is already low, uh, only 200 follicles. BMI is beyond what we would like. And obviously, these patients have different uh, outcomes, different expectations, and, and, and obviously different treatments. So this is what we used to do in the past. We used to take into consideration age, BMI, and, and look at the ovarian status, looking at the FSH. And this is how uh, we're doing things today, looking at, uh, of course, age, but taking into consideration number one AMH and number two AFC. And with these three parameters, we can benefit <coughs> uh, to establish a, a more realistic prognosis. And this has been done to the advancements of, of technology, technology to measure AMH, and technology on the scanners, the ones that we used in the beginning and the ones we use today are completely different. Because technology is, is everywhere. And just to give you an example of, of how technology is changing our lives, you can see what was the image of the proclamation of the Pope a few years ago. This is 2005, and this was the room. And after a few years, the same uh, story proclamation of the Pope 2013. So it was full of, of uh, uh, iPhones or whatever it is. So this is uh, obviously technology becoming cheaper and cheaper and, and available all over the world. So this is what happened to the scanners. For instance, all of you, I'm sure you're using high-resolution scanners today. I remember when I was a resident uh, a few years ago, you know, transvaginal scan was starting. You had to look at the ovaries through the transabdominal probe. Uh, big mistakes, huge variability, and then the, the vaginal probes came, and today the images that you get with your scanners are very close to MRI, so they're really, really precise. They correlate the central follicles very well with the primordial follicle population, if you take a biopsy. They're highly sensitive to uh, hormones, and it's a very good surrogate marker to predict the response to gonotropin. So if you see eight antral follicles, more or less you're gonna get eight follicles, and, and the correlation is quite good. The benefits is that you can do this immediately. You see the patient, you put the probe, you know the numbers. You can do it in any clinic and the results are immediately available. But there's a lack of a standardization. That means that uh, there's no standards to how to measure uh, um, antrophological count. There's a very high inter and intra variability, as I'll show you now in a while. And it's going to be, uh, to be very much dependent on the equipment that you use. So the best the scanner you have, the better the scanner you have, the better the results. If you are the best doctor in the world, but you have a poor scanner, the results will be poor. If you are a good doctor, but you have the best scanner, you will have uh, very good uh, reliability. And also, patients are different. Sometimes you have a nice image of the ovary. Sometimes the patient has a, a thick fibrosis with endometriosis and difficult to see, and it's sometimes not so easy to measure them. Trying to use 3D for this has not been very uh, um, informative. It's time consuming. The results you didn't get them immediately. It's not available everywhere. And the prediction is not better than using the conventional 2D probes. Regarding the variability, here you can see the intra observer variability in the left. And this is interesting. This is the same doctor measuring the same patient twice. And you can see a high, high variability uh, between us. And there is also a very high variability uh, inter observer. So that means that two different doctors measuring the same patient, again, you have a high variation. So AFC is good, but it's far from perfect. The other biomarker that we're using today more and more, I'm sure you use it almost on a daily basis, is your AMH produced by the granulosa cells of very small antral follicles and preantral, of course. And the certain levels that you get correlate very well, again, with the primordial follicle population. So it's going to give us a very nice estimation on the recruitment rate as well. 
benefits of AMH, as you know, is full automation today. Uh, you have international standards that we didn't have for AFC, and there is minimal interlab variation with this new automated test, so it's quite reproducible. The problem is that until very recently, there were different kits in the market, and this created some confusion among us, and the old generation had this uh, variability, as I'll show you now. But again, I think that the new study is coming out with this automated uh, ROS uh, AMH immunosea. I think they are quite consistent and much more reliable. This was what happened in, uh, in the past. Different labs gave different results. You take a sample, you send it to three different labs, and you get different outcomes, so that's confusing. And this is why sometimes patients come to you with AMH going up. They say, I had 0.8, but today I have 2.4. So, so different labs, different times, so obviously not, not very reliable. And again, <coughs> this is a representation. Ten labs with the same sample, you can go from here up to here. So the old tests were good, but again, far from perfect. Is it good to predict AMH uh, poor response? I think it's the best predictor we have today. This is data from uh, the Dutch. You can see in this, uh, it's, a, it's a systematic review. H is not very predictive. You know this is the, the ROC curve. You know these curves. The more you go to the upper left corner, the better the prediction. The more you go in the diagonal, the less predictor is. So it means 50% of the population is down, 50% is up. So you want to be uh, upper left. That would be the, the best. H is not predictive of the response very much. You can see almost a diagonal. FSH is slightly better. Antifollicle count is 0 0.76 and AMH is 0.80 in, in dark black. So even if you combine AMH with the other two, it will not go up. So it seems that AMH is the best predictor for a poor response. Not for pregnancy, you can see. Pregnancy, it's a diagonal. So it's good for the response in poor responders. What about high responders? And high responders, again, this is uh, more recent data from Nelson. And you can see how the area under the curve is 0.81 for AMH and high response. And if you combine AMH with H, AFC, and FSH, is 0.81. So again, just one simple predictor is going to tell us uh, probably the best that this patient is going to have a high risk of excessive response. And in fact, if you take data from the Megaset trial, which is uh, <coughs> a large uh, randomized controlled trial with single embryo transfer, you can see how in, in good prognosis patients, AMH is going to predict much better the response compared to AFC, you can see in blue dots the AMH uh, um, correlation coefficient of the, of the data with the response compared to AFC, which has more variability, as, as we might expect. Uh, so AMH is interesting, but it's not enough to say you should not be treated. And sometimes people say, how low should you go with AMH to f say, no, I'm not doing IVF on this patient. And I think we should not do that, basically because there's even spontaneous pregnancies with undetectable AMH. Of course, anecdotal cases, but you can have very, very low AMH, and if you're young, you can have a pregnancy. So <clears throat> what we did is we reviewed uh, more than 5,000 cycles. We presented this in Israel last year to see what happened with very low AMH patients. And as we might expect, you see that the age is going uh, down as AMH is going up. AMH is down here. When you have very low AMH, you have obviously low antrophollicle count in red that increases with AMH. You have a higher recruitment of uh, oocytes in green with increasing AMH. But interestingly, if you look at the pregnancy rate, it's more or less stable. So that means that if the age is not too advanced and you do a, a reasonable ovarian stimulation, the success rates are also reasonable. If they stay more or less stable. So it means that even if your AMH is low, if the patient is young, the success is going to be quite good. What about AMH and pregnancy? Well, some papers claim that there's a, a relationship, some others do not. And obviously this is a slightly biased because the higher your AMH, the higher the response. And obviously the higher the response tends to be correlated with AIDS and with better outcome. So higher pregnancy rate with higher AMH, but still the data is not very solid from my point of view. So at the end of the day, what do we want in, in IVF? We want to have uh, three or four uh, blastocysts to have single embryo transfer, maybe double sometimes. And to get three or four blastocysts, we need five or six day three embryos. And for that, we need six to seven day two, or maybe eight to 10, or 12 or 14. This is what we need. With this, we can have a nice outcome and, and a nice uh, cycle. So this is what we want to have, nice outcome. But then the life gets complicated. Life gets in the middle, and we never uh, really get what we want to get, not, not always. So how real is this? I mean, we know it's good for the patient, we know it's feasible, we can do it, but how real is this? So again, we are scientists, we don't, 
we cannot rely on, I have good results, you know, it works for me, I have good outcome, how good? You have to put numbers, you have to put data, and, and this is what we need. We, we need evidence, and the evidence is here. This is the evidence from uh, Arce's paper, I'm sure you've seen this paper before. And this is interesting, this is data from a new product, a uh, new uh, rec FSH that is being developed by, by Ferrin, that uh, probably um, Professor Anderson uh, will, will develop. But this is interesting data because, as I showed you before, it shows clearly that if you increase the dose of FSH, you have higher number of oocytes, but you don't have more blastocysts. Even if you have high AMH or low AMH, the number of blastocysts is going to remain stable. So this is where we want to aim. We want to aim to high efficacy with diminishing the risk of cancellation because of low exposure of the follicles and diminishing the risk of uh, cancellation or hyperstimulation. So in, in the next lecture, we will hear about this study that is a, it's a beautiful study. It's an Esther one. Uh, it's a randomized, accessor blind, control, and multicenter trial. Uh, it's a huge trial, almost 1,400 patients, in which uh, they took the first IVF cycle, 18 to 14 years of age. It's antagonist-based protocol, single uh, blastocyst transfer. And they compared two strategies, which is uh, the folytropin delta, the Recovel, which is this new rec FSH. And in this, they used uh, individualized dosing. So they took AMH, body weight, and according to that, uh, they put a fixed dose through the cycle, no changes, no adjustments, versus the conventional standard dose. So you can go from 150 for the first five days up to 450 later with individual adjustments. <clears throat> and we will see the results in the next lecture. But the main concept is that even if we have good outcome, even if the last 20 or, 20 or, or 37 years, as, as Professor was mentioning before, uh, things have improved dramatically, but there's still room for improvement. I think as, as uh, you know, Steve Jobs was a perfectionist, and he said, good enough is not good enough. There's always room to improve what we do, and I think this is how we should work on a daily basis. So, to finalize, I think we can conclude that individualized ovarian stimulation is good for the patient to maximize the results and to minimize the risks. I think it's feasible through biomarkers, as I told you, that reduce the inter and intraobservable variability, and AMH seems to be superior to AFC. However, inter-individual as well as inter-cycle variation means that ovarian stimulation still remains an art. Thank you very much.